This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Millions of years before the dawn of man, ants had learned to live in large, complex societies. They had also mastered the art of war. Since their sources of food were much larger than themselves, they killed their prey by strategic attack. Today, a highly aggressive, often deadly breed of ant threatens to spread like a plague throughout much of the United States. In the tropical jungles of Central and South America, everyday reality can have the appearance of pure illusion. Animated leaves seem to march down a hanging vine. In truth, each leaf's movement is the work of a tiny but powerful ant. They are known as the leaf cutters. Leaf cutters are the farmers of the jungle. One colony transports over a ton of leaves a year to its underground city. The leaves themselves will not be eaten. A fungus which will grow on the stored leaves provides the entire colony with its single source of food. Leaf cutter ants have tremendous strength. Held by the ant's powerful mandibles, a single leaf weighing as much as the ant itself will often be carried more than a hundred yards. To equal this feat, a man would have to carry 150 pounds in his teeth. For nearly every jungle animal, survival hangs in delicate balance. Both predator and prey are highly affected by the slightest change in the jungle's fragile ecology. Food cannot be taken for granted. Its abundance is never assured. If the taper cannot find its daily requirement of buried roots and bulbs, it faces starvation. The tiny ant, however, has a distinct advantage over other jungle species. It is older, more resilient to change, and much better adapted to its unpredictable environment. The hollow branches of a young Cecropia tree is the favorite home of Aztec ants. The Aztecs have powerful mandibles and a vicious bite. If their tree is disturbed in any way, the entire colony will swarm out to attack the intruder. A foreign vine placed against the tree quickly rallies the colony in defense of its home. A frenzied attack will not end until the vine has been completely removed. The Tamandua, or anteater, will rarely venture a visit to a Cecropia tree. It is content to search for termite nests high in the branches of other trees. Among the most legendary and feared of all jungle predators is a group of tiny, fast-moving ants. They travel like soldiers in well-organized columns, continually searching for food. The highly developed cooperation among hundreds of thousands of ants transforms their mobile colony into a single ferocious creature. They are called army ants. When army ants move through the jungle, they establish temporary bivouacs by forming a solid mass with their own bodies. Using their hooked feet, thousands of workers attach themselves together in successive rows. The rows hang down to form an intricate living wall which protects the queen inside. Every morning, hundreds of raiding parties set out in search of prey. A chance encounter with a rival species of army ants sets the stage for the day's first battle. Both ants are armed with sharp mandibles and a deadly sting. They will fight to the death. While raiding columns frantically hunt for other sources of food, 
a powerful bite finally cripples the opponent. A larger prey suffers a coordinated mass attack. Once it has been paralyzed by dozens of stings, the army ants carefully dissect their victim and carry it piece by piece back to the bivouac. In a single day, thousands of insects will become helpless victims of the ravenous army ant. Wherever raiding ants move, other animals follow along, hoping to feed on their fleeing prey. There are other kinds of deadly ants which live in the jungle completely alone. They are solitary hunters and highly efficient killers. For the predaceous ant, a much larger katydid makes an easy victim. Nearly an inch long, the predaceous ant will attack insects many times its size. Possessed of incredible strength, it can easily lift the katydid and carry it off. Its venom is deadly. A single sting can paralyze, even kill, a grown man. Most of us regard ants as insignificant pests, a nuisance in the kitchen or at a picnic. But for many people in the United States, that attitude has undergone a forcible change. The problem has been caused by a tiny but fierce red ant, the fire ant. In fields and pastures throughout the South, large earth mounds loom above the ground, signaling that the invader is there. The mounds are built and inhabited by fire ants. The fire ant mound forms only the tip of a vast colony which can extend 20 feet underground. Highly aggressive, the fire ant's armament includes razor-sharp mandibles for biting and a painful burning sting that gives the ant its name. Within each fire ant colony, specialized workers do nothing but build and repair. The work is constant. It begins when the colony is established and the mound itself must be built. As the colony grows, new tunnels and chambers must be added continually. In about three years, the mound may reach over a yard high and contain more than 250,000 ants. If split down the middle, the mound is revealed as an intricate network of interconnecting tunnels and chambers. Buried deep in some of the chambers lie the developing eggs of new ants. The eggs are frequently moved from place to place by specialized workers. When the sun warms the mound, eggs are carried toward the top. At night or during cold weather, the developing brood is hauled deep below ground level where the temperature is warmer. Other workers specialize in storing food or in keeping the mound clean. Still others stand on constant guard, ready to sound an alert. The slightest disturbance to the mound instantly rallies thousands of biting, stinging ants in defense of the colony. The aggressive fire ants wage regular warfare on all other kinds of ants they encounter. Unable to see or hear, they communicate their strategy by chemical odors called pheromones. They rarely lose a battle. Wherever fire ants have spread, they have quickly eradicated native ants, establishing themselves as the singular species. Fire ants are voracious predators. Their colonies require a huge and regular supply of food. Given to attacking in overwhelming numbers, fire ants will actually delay an attack until sufficient ants have gathered to ensure an easy conquest. Fire ants devour insects as the mainstay of their diet. They also eat earthworms, grubs, and spiders.
fire ants attack beneficial insects as well as harmful ones. They are indiscriminate killers. In many parts of the south, vast areas are scarred with more than 200 fire ant mounds per acre. In the United States, fire ants have no natural enemies. At present, there is no way to stop them. Today, fire ants infest more than 150 million acres in nine southern states, from North Carolina to Texas. Highly adaptable, their mounds can be found nearly everywhere. In parks and playgrounds, in fields and vacant city lots, along sidewalks and roadsides, around houses, on lawns, near schools and hospitals, even in the middle of cities. The main shopping street of Gulfport, Mississippi is completely undermined with thousands of fire ant tunnels. The ants have no problem finding food and thriving. The red fire ant is a relative newcomer to this country. They arrived in Mobile, Alabama sometime between 1933 and 1945. A few ants were probably hidden in the cargo of a freighter from their native Brazil. They jumped ship and quickly multiplied. By the early 1950s, farmers started to complain. The fire ant had begun to interfere with their livelihood. The ants' hard earth mounds clogged equipment and bent cutting blades. No longer just a bothersome pest, the fire ant was becoming a major nuisance. Complaints about the fire ant mounted quickly. Fire ants invaded bales of hay, rendering them useless as feed for animals. Field workers, whose jobs required them to spend long hours near fire ant mounds, were frequently attacked and painfully stung. Young farm animals were sometimes killed when they strayed into ant-infested pastures. A chemical war against the fire ant was launched. It began on a small scale and then escalated. Cyanide, Chlordane, Dieldrin, Heptachlor, Keepone. Virtually every insecticide known to man was used against the fire ant. Yet the number of ants only increased. They continued to spread. In 1962, a newly discovered insecticide called Myrex offered new hope for the war against the ants. Large areas of land were covered with small pellets of bait containing the insecticide. Where other chemicals had failed, this one seemed to control the ants. A fleet of vintage B-17 bombers was converted to drop insecticide. Their single mission? To destroy the fire ant. Pain has been called the Vietnam of entomology. It lasted for years, covered vast areas of land and cost millions of dollars. When it was over, there were more fire ants than before. The fire ants have continued to multiply and spread, and scientists are searching frantically for a new weapon against them. At the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Fire Ant Control Lab, nearly 4,000 new insecticides have been carefully tested. So far, none has proved both safe and effective. A winged fire ant queen, ready for mating. The major problem in controlling the spread of fire ants lies in their method of reproduction. Mating takes place not on the ground, but high in the air. Unfertilized winged queens are produced in large numbers by every colony. At mating time, usually in the spring, they leave the colony for a nuptial flight. A hovering cloud of winged male ants waits in the sky high above them. The queens fly up to the males to be inseminated.
After their aerial rendezvous, the fertile queens fly back to the ground. Each is programmed by nature to establish a new colony wherever she lands. The queen's new colony may be located hundreds of yards or even miles from her original mound. Within a month, a small underground colony has emerged around the queen. The first generation of workers tends the developing larva with care, keeping them warm and alive. The queen herself receives constant attention. A group of specialized workers does nothing but groom and feed her. The only way the workers can identify her is by the chemical odor or pheromone which she exudes. For the rest of her life, the queen will do nothing but lay eggs, millions of them. Each developing egg is carefully guarded and cared for. Quickly, the emerging colony will multiply in size. Scientists have isolated the queen pheromone and are attempting to use it in their struggle to control the fire ant. When the pheromone is spread on a stick, workers mistake it for the queen. They react automatically and carry it into the colony. The pheromone odor may someday serve as a way to deliver new insecticides into the core of a fire ant mound. At present, however, it is only an experiment which holds some promise for the future. Parasitic mites sometimes infest the bodies of fire ants. This fact has led scientists to search for other organisms that could control the ant population. So far, none has been found. Viewed through an electron microscope, the tiny fire ant takes on grotesque form. Nearly half of its head area is taken up by two sharp mandibles, each with three points to tear and bite. The fire ant's real wallop, however, comes from its venomous stinger, not its bite. Using a tiny syringe, agriculture department scientist, Dr. Mike Glancy, carefully milks venom from a dissected fire ant. The venom is unique in the animal world. It is a burning alkaloid chemical similar to the substances found in poisonous plants. The fire ant's venom makes an accidental sting a very painful experience. The ant first bites the skin with its mandibles, then it injects poison with the stinger. The result is a painful pustule which lasts several days. Dogs that play in fire ant areas are highly vulnerable. This puppy was savagely attacked. Farm animals grazing in infested pastures frequently receive numerous painful stings. This woman fell on a fire ant mound and was badly stung. In 1974, foraging fire ants entered the window of a convalescent home and stung this woman hundreds of times. She barely survived. As the fire ant has spread, it has taken a human toll. People have died from complications such as gangrene, which developed from fire ant stings. The elderly, the allergic, and people with circulatory problems are especially vulnerable to the venom. The list of victims will undoubtedly grow. The fire ant is multiplying and spreading at an incredible rate. Today, fire ants are sweeping westward and also to the north. They are moving through Texas and are expected eventually to reach California. If a fertilized queen should land aboard a cross-country truck or stow away in someone's camping gear, they could quickly infest vast new areas. Scientists have projected that the region as far northwest as Seattle, Washington is destined to be infested by fire ants. In the Northeast, even New York City may someday be plagued by the ant.
Wherever fire ants spread, they will leave their mark on those unlucky enough to encounter them. The scientific name of the fire ant is Solenopsis invicta. It means the unconquered ant. The struggle between man and insects is as old as man himself. We have rarely, if ever, gained the advantage. In the short time that fire ants have inhabited the United States, they have undergone evolutionary changes. They have quickly adapted themselves to better survive and exploit their environment. Special colonies have been found containing not one, but as many as 20,000 queens. It was recently discovered that some fire ants have adapted their bodies to store food for better survival in cold temperatures. Sixty years ago, an entomologist wrote, since the world began, we have never exterminated, we probably shall never exterminate as much as one single insect species. If there ever was an example of an insect we cannot destroy, the fire ant is it. Coming up next, 20th Century with Mike Wallace investigates the unsettling cases of murderers Charles Manson and John Wayne Gacy. Then Weapons at War takes a look at anti-aircraft cannon, rockets, and radar defense systems. And log on at Veterans.com, a new website brought to you by the History Channel. Veterans.com, a place where veterans, their families, and others can connect, share stories, and pass on the legacies of all American veterans. <laughs>